Welcome to the Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Capitalism has lifted billions of people out of poverty in the last 250 years, yet it remains vilified, demonized, mistrusted. Uh, in particular, the profit modi is generally equated with greed and therefore evil. Uh, so what should be the purpose of business? Is it profit or, or something else? Uh, joining me to talk about this is Yaron Brook, chairman of the Ian Rand Institute, host of the Yaron Brook Show, editor of In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance, and what I consider, who I consider generally a great man, great man of courage and intellect. So Yaron, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good to yeah. see you. You're good to see you again, too. What's it been, 15 years, 20 years since we first met? Since we first met, probably. Yeah. Close yeah, yeah. Close to 20 and uh, haven't seen you probably in uh, eight, nine years uh, yeah, well, since the financial crisis. Well, I thought you were doing good work then. I think you're doing good work now. So we're, uh, we're, we're back at it in a different mode. Uh, you, you just recently debated with John Mackey, who's the very, very effective and I think great CEO of Whole Foods about whether business should focus on profit. And I want to talk about that, but also I wanted to get clear just how beneficial capitalism as business has been to the world over the last 250 years. You've got some, you've got some data on that, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you go back 250 years to about the founding of this country to that period, basically 95% of the entire global population was living on $2 a day or less. And I'm inflation, inflation adjusting, so there's no, no uh, trickery going on here. $2 a day of less. It, you know, anybody in the audience can think about what that means. How would one today live on $2 a day unless you couldn't? It, it, it's, it's a horrific, uh, horrific life. And that's how all of humanity lived. And since then, we have seen unbelievable progress in terms of wealth, in terms of quality of life, standard of living. 250 years ago, life expectancy in the most advanced countries in the world was 39. Most of the world it was closer to 29. So we're talking about, we've much more than doubled life expectancy now. Uh, in spite of COVID, in spite of everything we're living through, life is unbelievably good by historical comparison. And all of that is really a consequence of freedom. It's a consequence of leaving people alone to pursue their own happiness and, and protect their rights. And, and that's what capitalism really is. Capitalism uh, is a system that where the government leaves you free to pursue your values free of coercion and where they, they protect your rights, primarily property rights in the context of economics, but where they leave you free. So if you think about 95% of humanity living under poverty 250 years ago, in extreme poverty, $2 a day or less, and then you look at 30 years ago, the number was about 30%, so a huge decline. But then if you look at today, it's 8%, 8%. Mm -hmm. 95% to 8%. Now, how did we get to 8%? Not because of foreign aid, not because of global charity, not because people trying to do good, but actually people trying to do good in another way. That is people starting businesses, hiring people, engaging in commerce and trade. And as Asia's opened up and freed up their economies and adopted even a little bit of capitalism, they have prospered. So Today, global poverty is, again, by far at the lowest it's ever been in history, all as a consequence of this amazing system of capitalism. Middle class is, is massive and global and increasing. We're seeing countries in Africa adopt these principles, these principles of capitalism. They are thriving. This has nothing to do with race, ethnic group, geography, anything like that. It has to do with universal principles that lead to human flourishing and capitalism captures those universal principles. Well, as I thought about our conversation today, I think I probably got 15 or 20 items. We could probably spend five or six hours. We've got roughly 40 minutes, so I might want to get right into the heart of the matter. Sure. And at the heart of the matter, if you think about business, capitalism, finance, it's the profit motive. And nothing seems to be more demonized than the profit motive. We're looking at uh, Somebody like Larry Fink, who runs BlackRock, who I think manages three or four trillion dollars, I may be exaggerating by not much, who's now telling CEOs of public companies that they've got to invest in ESG, which I think means environmental social governance, which is not at the heart of the profit motive or, 
or or is it? Now, you and John talk maybe in a different dimension. I wanted to get into that first. John talks about a purpose-driven business, and he sets out all these metrics for, for motivating people sure. in the business and externally to, to see the vision for what the business is supposed to be. And I, you know, that it's hard to argue with that. And you argue that the, uh, that the business is about shareholder wealth maximization and profit. Now, is there a big difference between those two things? I think the difference is uh, a difference of focus and the difference of what is primary. Business is a unique institution among all human institutions. And what makes it unique is it is about creating value for profit. Nonprofits create value for other things. A government creates value, sometimes it usually destroys value, but when it creates value, it creates value in a different mechanism. But the mechanism by which business creates value and measures value is through the profit motive. Look, what is profit? Profit me is the difference between what it costs me to produce something and what somebody is willing to pay for that thing. That is the value I've added, in a sense, to the world. I've taken a bunch of different elements, put them together, and increased their value. Right? If I hadn't increased their value, nobody would be willing to pay more for them. So profit symbolizes, profit is a, uh, places a monetary value, a dollar amount, on how much value is being created. When a business is extraordinarily profitable, that means it's extraordinary in terms of the amount of value it is creating for, for other people, because other people are the one buying the product. So uh, to me, the focus is on making a profit. That's what you as a CEO do. You're trying to maximize the profit of the business, you know, within the bounds of ethical behavior and, and within the bounds of what I think the mission of the business is. But in order to do that, in order to motivate your employees and in order to motivate yourself, in order, there is a certain vision you have for the business. And that vision is to be the best company in a particular industry or to, or to produce X amount of value for your customers. You're, you're oriented towards your customers in your vision. But at the end of the day, your owners, who are, who are the shareholders, that's whose wealth value you're creating. Well, you think about so-called natural resources. There are really no natural resources. It's what our creativity is brought to bear to make something a resource. And you know, the notion that, that, uh, that profit and greed are somehow a negative when people go about setting to create something, create value. But, but what I think about business is you take some inputs and you rearrange them, you get creative, you think about what would be uh, desirable uh, for somebody to buy, pay for. And if your revenue is bigger than the cost of your inputs, well, then you've got a profit. It's nothing right. very sinister. It's as simple as uh, efficiently allocating uh, your, your capital labor and, uh, and your finance. Well, and, and creating real value for people, right? That's why they're willing to pay for you. Why is somebody yeah. willing to pay for you, uh, to pay you something? Why is why somebody, why am I willing to pay $1,000 for an iPhone? I'm willing to pay $1,000 for an iPhone, not because all the components in the iPhone add up to $1,000. I'm willing to pay $1,000 for the iPhone because it adds more to my life than if I didn't own it. It adds more to my life than the $1,000 I'm giving up for it. So I'm winning, Apple is winning, it's a win-win transaction. Apple is making a profit representing how much the iPhone adds to my life above and beyond the, the cost of all the components that went into that iPhone. So, so when he, go ahead. So, so their profit represents the value added to me, right? The value added to my life. Now, beyond, at the minimum. But beyond that, think about, you, you brought up natural resources. People forget this, but oil, that black stuff, black stuff that comes out of the ground, yeah. that gunky. It used to be that that would lower the value of your property if you found oil on your property because you couldn't grow anything on it. It was really hard to get rid of it. And it was useless, useless. And then people innovated. People used it, you know, discovered that this thing had properties and used science and used engineering and used technology to turn this black gunk into the most efficient uh, producer of energy human beings have ever seen. And we, uh, the entire world has changed because of cheap energy resulting from that black gunk. And what is the profit? The profit is taking that black gunk, turning it into something human beings can use, providing them with the value of that usage, and getting paid for it, making everybody's life better in that way. 
So why is profit demonized? I mean, I've, I've made my way in on Wall Street and run businesses. And obviously, I understand that profit is a good thing because it allows you to attract capital that if you're doing something well, you can build more of it and, and, and create even more value for, uh, for your customers. Uh, See, profit what, is what's, what's the moral, what's the moral yeah. issue we're, we're facing here? Why, why are, why are businessmen demonized because we seek a profit? So here, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty controversial in this point in the sense that I think we're demonized. That's, that's why I wanted to talk with you. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 businessmen are demonized because we've demonized self-interest. Yeah. Businessmen are self-interested. They're about making money. And, and it's not that you go and make profit so that you can invest it and make more profit. You make a profit because it's great to make a profit, right? It, you make a profit because you can uh, live a better life off of the benefits of that profit. You can invest that profit to make even more profit. True, but again, it benefits you. Yes, there is a benefit to everybody else, but the ultimate motivation of going to work and producing is the joy we get out of the work we do. And it's the profit we generate from it. And it's self-interested. And yet we live in a society going back thousands of years, not new, that has demonized self-interest, that has demonized anything associated with self-interest. If you're not sacrificing, if you're not, if, if you're not, you know, suffering, then you're never going to be a, a morally virtuous person. All our saints are people who suffer. They're not happy. Well, one of my, one of my, well, Maureen, my producer, uh, day-to-day -day producer with the show asked me before we go and went on, she said, now, are you going to be talking about selfishness less, selfishness or selflessness? Yep. And I said, well, that's what we're going to be talking about. Is it be better to be, uh, you know, interested in yourself and your own happiness, or is it be more, uh, is it better to be interested in somebody else and, and their happiness? And yeah, I mean, in my view, the purpose, your moral purpose in life, your moral purpose in life is your own happiness. Now, the way to attain your own happiness, just like the way to attain profit, is not by exploiting people. It's not by treating people badly. It's not by being an emotionalist. It's not by following your whim. Uh, the way to achieve happiness, just like the way to achieve profit, is by treating people with respect by trading with them, win-win relationships. I like to say that the, the purpose here is to create as many win-win relationships as you can. And, and that, and, and by in, a, in, in, in terms of pursuing your happiness, by thinking, by using your mind, by being rational in pursuit of your self-interest. So not self-interest to Ayn Rand and, and to me and, and to people who advocate for these ideas is not about doing whatever you feel like doing. It's not about doing whatever your whim tells you to. It's by calculating, thinking, figuring out what's good for you and doing that. Well, and you don't believe in a system without guardrails. We, you know, we believe in property rights, rule of law, uh, you know, fairness and, and uh, having, having good courts to protect people against. You know, let's face it, not everybody is uh, that great a person. And there's, there are people who can bad crimes, people. but, but, but. But there's such a difference between a, a, a company. Let, let's take Apple. Yeah. I mean, is, is, is the symbol of, of capitalism Gordon Gecko, or is it Steve Jobs? I, I think that 98% of the people that we admire are the capitalists in the mode of Steve Jobs, who, who creates something that everybody wants. He, he was in it for a profit. See, one of the real evils of a movie like Wall Street and one of the real evils of, of the general attitude towards finance is that we take a, somebody who's clearly a crook, clearly evil, clearly a bad guy like Gordon Gecko. I mean, his speeches, everybody remembers his greed speech, which is actually a very good speech. It was a pretty good speech. <laughs> yeah, it's a very good speech. <laughs> On its own, that was pretty good, except he was the villain. He's about it. And, and Oliver Stone lets us know he's not serious about it by the music he puts on right after the speech, which is Take Me to the Moon, Let Me Fly Among the Stars by Frank Sinatra, which is clearly an indication that this is just kind of BS. This isn't real, right? Gordon Gekko's real attitude towards finance, towards wealth, towards capitalism is, is later on in the movie where he tells his protege, he tells him the world is it's a zero-sum game. My gain is somebody else's loss, and I'm going to screw people if I have to in order to get my gain. And that's just not true, but that doesn't work. 
people is that's who he really is. And of course, he lands up in jail as a consequence, and, and justifiably so. But finance is not about that. That's not what finance is. Finance is about win win. Finance is about the rational, long term allocation of capital to create profit, which is a which is it, which is a representative of the values that those investments are creating. It, it and and so Golden Gecko, the evil of the movie is that it presents Golden Gecko as a typical financier, is what you think somebody like Mike Milken was. When we know it's the exact opposite of what a typical financier is and what a good financier is. Well, uh, yeah, I, I worked in the merger and acquisition business, and you know, I, I read recently somebody was writing. Well, of course, the whole merger and acquisition business has no economic value, shouldn't exist. And I began thinking about, well, wait a second, I, I worked for companies, owners of companies that had done as much as they could with their business. They wanted to sell it, and so what I would do is I'd try to find somebody who could see more of the business than than the current owners. And I like to think about what I was doing as taking an asset and putting into stronger hands. Absolutely. And by doing that, you're creating a lot of value because uh, that, it, 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 you know, the strong ownership, people have great ideas about what to do with an asset is, is the heart of, uh, uh, of innovation. And, and of course, what you're doing is you're reallocating capital. Sometimes that involves laying people off. Sometimes it involves making the business more efficient. Sometimes it involves shutting down a plant. But what you're doing there is allocating capital to better uses, which creates more jobs, more wealth, raises more people out of poverty than keeping the oil industry alive. People, people abstract away from this. That's at some point we had, you remember the typewriter business? Typewriters? <laughs> well, people like you took the value that was in the typewriter businesses, the capital and the labor, and we allocated it to the computer industry reallocated those talent, reallocated the capital so that we could advance, so that we could get better. If we had stuck with typewriters, we wouldn't be doing Zoom right now, right? Um, if we'd stuck with buggies, we'd have no automobiles today. And it's financiers who are the ones who reallocate capital to these new ventures, take it from old dying industries and, and, and uh, allocate it to new thriving businesses. And net, they're the ones responsible for this increase in wealth that capitalism has produced because, you know, Schumpeter, the, the, the famous uh, economist, called it creative destruction. Sometimes you need to shut down certain plants in order to open up other plants. Everybody thinks, oh, the, the Rust Belt was shut down and manufacturing jobs went to China, which is complete nonsense. Manufacturing jobs went to machines. They went to computers and to robots. And the factories that were shut down, that capital went to Silicon Valley, and created many, many more high-paying jobs in America than the jobs that were taken away when those, when those rust-built industries were shut down. So that's the beauty of capitalism. It's the beauty of financial markets that they make that possible. Let me ask you the question that the social justice people would make. Well, what about all the people left behind? I mean, you've, you've created these new businesses, but what about the people working in the old businesses? What's your, what's your answer to that? Those people live in a richer society. Those people live in a free society. And those people, to the extent that they're willing to take responsibility over their own lives, which I think our system doesn't incentivize them to do, but if they were interested in taking responsibility over their own lives, would and could be retrained and produce much more than they used to be able to produce. Robots enhance productivity. They enhance productivity of everybody. And people are better off with the existence of robots. Now, we live in a society where we don't encourage people to move. We don't encourage people to retrain. We don't encourage people to take personal responsibility over their own life and their own happiness, their own success. I always tell people, instead of presidents now for 30 years telling steel workers in the Midwest, don't worry, we're bringing the jobs back. Instead of saying that to them, imagine a president saying to them, get in your cars and drive to uh, Western Arkansas where there's tons of jobs or go to where the jobs are. Stop sitting and waiting for the jobs to come to you. The American way, the American spirit was always to create your own future, to create your own opportunities. Go out there and find the plenty of jobs in America and have been for decades. 
it's it's a and this is why <laughs> this is why we're such a magnet for immigrants, right? Because there are plenty of jobs in this country. Um, Americans need to discover that, and Americans need to take the action in order to go and take advantage of those opportunities that exist. And of course, as we know, if the government got out of the way more, if we deregulated uh, more, if the government shrunk and stopped spending as much as it did, if it stopped providing negative incentives to businessmen and to workers, then the number of jobs that existed in America is unlimited. Well, I've got a $5 word I like to use or term called voluntary exchange, which is where you get a willing buyer, willing seller, they enter into an agreement, and it's a win-win for everybody. And what's been happening is we've got government inserting itself between a willing buyer and a willing seller and imposing certain outcomes. And, you know, that by definition destroys a whole lot of, of, of economic value, just no, it destroys freedom but it also just makes the economy more and more and more sluggish. What are we now? Because of this regulatory overhang, according to Heritage, weren't the, weren't the United States like one or two in the Freedom Index, and now we're 22 in the most recent ranking? So I think we used to be number, th in 1980, no, in, in, yeah, 19, in the, I think in 2000, we were number three in the world. Yeah. So when George Bush became president, we were number three. Today we're number twenty, and that and and the decline is a consequence of, in spite of the mythology, uh, Bush was a big spender and a big regulator. Uh, of course, we know Obama was a big spender and a big regulator. Trump was a big spender and, and it, it didn't reduce regulation through through um, legislation and, of course, raised tariffs. And now we've got a Biden administration, and through those presidencies, we've gone from number three to number twenty. Uh, which is a, a massive decline of economic freedom in the United States and, and truly tragic. And I would argue that even that number three in 2000, the two of us would say that wasn't that good. No, right? it was not uh, that great. <laughs> it, it, we could have been a lot freer in 2000. And yeah. indeed, the, the, you know, from an economic perspective, uh, freedom in the United States has declined steadily. I would argue probably since um, you know 1913, 14, and certainly since the New Deal under FDR. What's your take on what Larry uh, Fink is doing with BlackRock and imposing ECG uh, uh, requirements on uh, on uh, corporations? I, I think it's terrible. I, I actually would love to have people who invest with BlackRock sue him for a violation of his fiduciary duty. His fiduciary duty is to manage that money to the to his to, to maximize the wealth of pension plans of of investors in blackwater funds not to um use his uh philosophy of social justice or social whatever to dictate investments so uh i wish people would leave the problem in america today is that so much of the money in our markets is managed by pension plans Many of those pension plans are politicized. We, you know, governors often sit on um, on state pension plans, uh, uh, teacher unions, pension plans, CalPERS, CalSTRS in California are two of the largest institutional investors. They then um, are investors in BlackRock. BlackRock therefore caters to the politicized pension plans industries in the, you know the institutional investors uh, in this world, rather than to the individuals who own those pensions or to the individuals who invest directly in BlackRock? Well, do you think there's gonna be a trade-off between returns uh, for companies that invest in uh, uh, these, these, these uh, other social goods like environment, social and, and, uh, and governance? Or do you think that the companies that are gonna be focused on pure shareholder wealth maximization are gonna end up doing better in the long run? I think that the companies involved in maximizing shareholder wealth are going to do better in the long run. The problem is this. The problem is that those companies are getting penalized by regulators, by investors, and therefore the number of those companies are shrinking. So what you find when you actually go to these ESG, into these ESG portfolios, is you see that they pretty much invest in everything. They're just diversified portfolios of everything. And that's because they have twisted the arms of CEOs to at mm -hmm. the very least pretend to be ESG. So what we've had, what the real damage in my view is we've turned the entire US market and all almost all CEOs in America into people who at, at the very least give uh, lip service to ESG and at the very worst actually do it 
and therefore reduce productivity, reduce profitability, reduce wealth creation, and I think ultimately reduce GDP growth or growth in the economy overall. And I think that one of the reasons we've got our economy has not really grown much is, is we've barely seen an increase in, in quality and standard of living over the last 10 years or, or, or so, 12 years, is because of some of these policies that some of these companies are doing, not because they necessarily want to, but because they think their investors want it or the government want it or somebody else is forcing them. Well, most most CEOs of these big companies are really more more corporate uh, politicians in a way. I mean, they're they're a long way away from the marketplace and creating. One of the things services. that statism does is yeah. it discourages businessmen from becoming CEOs, and it encourages schmoozes and politicians to become CEOs. Because what is your job as a CEO? It becomes to 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 finagle the regulations more than anything else to deal with regulators, not to make money. Yeah, I saw that as a member of the financial services roundtable. Most of the CEOs of the big financial institutions were were gaming the system that way, and and that, that that's the reason I became to admire John Allison so much. I know he's been involved with Ann Rand. He was a real entrepreneur and had a principle based uh, uh, way to run his business that had nothing to do with gaming regulation. And for that, he just stands out in my mind as uh, as a, as, a, as an American hero. Well not just an American hero, a worldwide hero. I absolutely. I mean, uh, John is John is fantastic, both as a CEO, and, and he also has this intellectual side. I mean, he gives a great speech. And, and he's, a, he's kind of a, a businessman philosopher, which is which is pretty rare and a really unique individual. Yeah, I mean, uh, the world would be a much better place if we had uh, if we had many more businessmen who who uh, who emulated John Allison. Well, we got to we let, let's circle the, the John the John Mackey debate. Uh, you know, he got an, I, I it, it's very I think in ways in many ways you two were talking about the same thing but using different words. Uh, we've got this notion there's there's the shareholders, but then they're also the customers, the suppliers, employees, uh, and, and 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 the community. And you've also got the investors, obviously, and that somehow you're supposed to maximize or optimize value for all those stakeholders, which are the near, nearly held. But as I think about it as a practical matter, if you want to run a business for profit, you've got to have happy customers. Your supplier relationships have got to be good. Your employees have got to be felt that they're being well taken care of, well treated, respected. And you have to have a good brand in the community. Otherwise, people are not going to buy your uh, product or service. So I don't, I don't see the... Uh, Here's a difference. I, I don't see the I don't see the, the the conflict except in 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 words because you can't you can't run a business with a win lose uh, attitude towards any of those stakeholders. Absolutely. So so first, to some extent, John presents this as a marketing issue, and and so he thinks that this is softer to say we're really trying to maximize the benefits to everybody and not just one group. And I and I get why he's doing that. He's trying to avoid the self interest. Uh, which is which is which is so tainted in our culture, but no, you see, I mean, you've been a CEO. Yes, you have to be good to your customers. You have to be good to all these groups, but you still need a way to make decisions. So I used to run this exercise with my students. I said, okay, let's assume that you've made uh, you you have an opportunity to close a plant in Illinois and open it up in Florida, and it turns out that if you do that, shareholders are significantly better off. Right, it's just it's a it's a profit making idea. You 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 still make money in Illinois, but if you move the plant to Florida, you're going to make more money. Right? How do you make that decision? So, according to John's methodology, you you make a list of all your stakeholders, and you somehow try to maximize everybody's well being. But the fact is, you're going to be laying off people in Illinois, so some employees in the short run are going to lose. Just reality, they're going to be laid off. But some employees in Florida are going to gain. They're going to be winners, right? How do you balance that? My point is, the only way to actually make decisions is to have a decision matrix. I'm going to maximize shareholder wealth. Sometimes that's going to mean customers are going to be unhappy. When, when the iPhone went from a, um, a, you remember the regular USB to like this special wire, some or, or took out the, the headphone jack or the iPhone. Some customers were upset. But you know what? It made sense long term. So 
Yeah. I, I was one of them. I like yeah. my I like my phone jack. <laughs> Sometimes you're gonna make customers a little unhappy. Yeah. But it makes sense for the company long term to do it if they took into account everything no. they did, all these different stakeholders. You'd never make a decision. You'd be stymied. And I believe that John, because he's such a good CEO, I think that John in the end works to maximize shareholder wealth while. As you say, you use the word marketing. I might use the word motivation because as a CEO, what you discover is that in this culture, most people are not going to get turned on when you come have them come into the office for a, a, a company meeting and say, our job here is to maximize profit. Yep. It just doesn't resonate. Yep. So what you say and said is our job is to create the best customer experience on the planet. Our job is to create the most wholesome food distribution that's whole foods i think i can't remember what uh, what amazon's was but it was it was a similar uh, high purpose that tends to get people more fired up day to day now what that you don't back you what you back into very quickly though is that tom soul who's the great economist said economics is about trade-offs mm -hmm. and business is about trade-offs and everything there's never anything that's a 99 1 decision it's always sort of a 55 45 decision and, uh, that, and that's why when I listened to you two, I thought, gee, they're really, you're just using. But the one thing you don't trade off, if you've got a decision that long-term will maximize shareholder wealth, you don't trade that away. You maximize long-term shareholder wealth. That's your job. That's why you're there. That's why shareholders employ you. That's what you're there for. Now, sometimes that'll mean laying some people off. Sometimes that'll mean changing suppliers. What about a time where you discover a better supplier? So right. what, about, what about the issue of, and we're facing it with China. I mean, I was a very, very strong free trader. I believe we ought to do as much business with China. I also 15, 20 years ago thought outsourcing to the lowest cost place would be a good idea. Uh, but in, in, in China in particular, we're paying a price because we've been doing business with a, uh, with a country that is in effect totally controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, and they're not really interested in liberal democracy or being invited into the world, the world uh, liberal community. They've, they've got something very different in mind. And so we now find ourselves with the, we made economic decisions to put a factory in China, or in Merck's case, we, they, they took a billion dollars and put an R&D center just, just near uh, uh, Beijing. Uh, I know you're, uh, how are, how are, I call myself a recovering libertarian for that reason, because I think there are other considerations uh, uh, that we need to take into, into account. And I'll further this and make it even more complicated where there are people say that CEOs whose companies are domiciled in the United States should think first of the United States and only thereafter, uh, you know, their, their company. So I think I've thrown you a five part question there, but uh, you can react any way you want. Well, so my view is the government has no business in this question, right? It could be that Merck decides that it was a strategic mistake to open up a plant in, in Beijing because of supply chain limitations and so on. But the government has no business. The, the best the government can do, and the only thing in my view the government should do, is create an environment in which um, uh, these companies, uh, you know, feel better about producing in the United States, and that's by lowering regulation, lowering taxes, and so on, but not by penalizing them, not by 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 increasing in intervention. Um, governments don't trade. The United States doesn't trade with China. China doesn't trade with the United States. I trade with Merck, who happens to produce maybe something in China, and they trade with some Chinese people. And, and, and it's trade in that, it, you know, individuals are, are, are the ones who trade. And government has no business getting in the middle, as you said, between voluntary transactions. Now, I might decide that I think uh, China is an abhorrent regime. And I, as an individual, do not want that regime to benefit from my trade. And therefore, I will not trade with China, uh, as I, you know, as, as I think was, uh, you know, is, is appropriate, could be appropriate today to do. I don't think it's the role of government to tell me who to trade with or not, unless, and let me put in the unless, unless the United States government declares that China is an enemy of the United States, a true enemy. And in that case, we shouldn't have an embassy there. And in that case, we should be, you know, uh, we, we should treat it as an enemy state, just like we do Iran and just like we do North Korea 
and they're out. But as long as from a foreign policy perspective, the government of the United States has not declared China as an enemy and still has, you know, we go over there and they come over here as diplomatics, uh, diplomat and pretend that we're all cozy, then the U.S. government has no business in raising tariffs or putting uh, trade restrictions. But I, I, I think we've got, I may differ with you on that because I think that we've got a much more nuanced problem with China and, and you don't want to declare war on China for a billion reasons, but there are also some self-protective reasons you don't want to do that. I mean, most of our major pharmaceuticals are manufactured in China and India or manufactured in India and then are subcontracted and then than branded through China. I, I don't think you can, you can, you can't find an aspirin manufacturer in the United States. Nobody. So we've, we've let this, we've let the free trade system evolve to this point where we've got these interdependencies. I don't know how you manage your way. I mean, interdependency is wonderful. We, I mean, it's the whole, the whole point of division of labor is to create interdependencies. It's, it's an amazing thing. I mean, the thing is that I think businesses are learning that they don't want to rely on one supplier. I think a lot of businesses moving to Vietnam, to India, ultimately maybe to South America and to Africa. It's not coming to back to the United States. I mean, that's a, that's a mythology. But it is going to be diversified across the world because nobody wants to be dependent on one entity. And they shouldn't from a purely business perspective, from a shareholder wealth maximization perspective. I think one of the things businesses are learning, Apple, for example, is building a lot of, of, of facilities in India right now because they don't want to be overly dependent on China. So business is learning. As we know, markets adapt. We get new information and you learn. But I also think that China, you know, we are helping create, turn China into a monster. Uh, and and, and I, I think the United States is much at fault in what is going on in the world right now and the turn away from capitalism and the word, turn away from freedom. Amplify um, that, amplify that. What do, yes. you, what do you mean? Why are we much at fault? In, we used to be, as Ronald Reagan used to call us, a shining city on a hill. Yeah. We used to be a symbol of freedom and capitalism and free trade and, and uh, no, you know, it, it, the best that capitalism had to offer. And we have for decades been moving away from that. I think the real turning point was 2008. I, I think when George Bush said, we have to bail out everybody in order to save capitalism from itself or some ridiculous mm -hmm. language like that. We basically sent a message to the world, a signal to the world that we were a failure, that our system of capitalism did not work. We blame capitalism for the financial crisis, which I think the two of us know is complete nonsense. Uh, financial capital, financial well, I, crisis. I have a couple of guys named Dodd and Frank, or uh, Dodd Frank, yes. Dodd and Mr. Dodd, and Mr. Frank, who I would. Anybody uh, should have gone to jail for the financial crisis, not bankers, it's Dodd and Frank. Right. Um, it, we, we increased regulations, we increased state involvement in the economy as a consequence. And we basically told the world in big letters, capitalism has failed. It was, it was the headline in our newspapers and it was the message by, by, by electing Obama and by nominating McCain. We basically told the world capitalism is useless. And then that's continued. Obama, Trump, Biden, all anti-capitalist presidents who, who, who projected an anti-capitalist mentality and told the world capitalism is a failure. And I think the Chinese looked at that and they said, okay, well, if that's the failure, then, then where do we go from here? And what they went is they basically went inwards in a sense of, we need more control. We need to do what America does on space. I mean, we did the same thing with COVID, by the way. It's funny. Um, so the last thing in the world an American would expect is when a pandemic hits, we have lockdowns. Who did we learn lockdowns from? No CDC document ever that has been written in the past in terms of planning for a pandemic had lockdowns as a solution. We learned it from China. We are becoming like China instead of China becoming like us. We, instead of fighting China on the basis of the way to liberalize your economy is to mimic us, we started doing what China does, that is telling companies how to run their business, uh, where they could produce, increasing tariffs, increasing controls, increasing regulation. Instead of modeling what capitalism looks like, we are modeling for China what, you know, we have now nationalist conservatives who want industrial policy, right, in the United States. It's so, scary. So who is the we, though, when we talk about it? Because I, I can't think of any of our political leaders, particularly, that have ever made, made this case. Uh, All of our we... political leaders. I can't think of a political leader who hasn't. Again, from 
I mean, all of them have have, have talked about, um, you know, em embracing this model of um, constraining or, or having the government involved directly in 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 individuals' decisions of placing themselves between traders, between voluntary exchange. All of our political leaders have embraced models where we try to benefit the steel industry at the expense of that industry. And well, I guess that, that, that's, what, that's what I meant, though. Nobody's making the free market case, the pure free no. market oh, case. Oh, there's so nobody know. making free yeah. market case, really, from the bully pulpit since Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the last president who, from the bully pulpit, actually made the argument for, for capitalism, for freedom. What do um, you, you, you think of Trump? I, I'm, I, <laughs> I'm very opposed to Trump. I think he was. I think he was very, very bad for America. Why? For multiple reasons. One, because many people think he represents capitalism, and he doesn't. He represents the opposite. He's a he's a central planner at heart, and and uh, and acted as one. Um, and you can see that. I mean, people talk about China with regard to Trump, and and he he failed with China in big ways. China became much worse under Trump than it was before Trump, and I think partially because of him. But but think about steel tariffs on Canada and Brazil and other countries. It wasn't about China. It was about his protectionism. He was a protectionist from day one. Um, but more than that, he 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 turned the presidency into vulgar. He vulgarized the the the, the, the presidency. Uh, he turned it into the Republicans into a political party that stood not for anything positive, but for just being anti-left. And I understand being anti-left. As you know, I'm very anti-left. Yeah. But that became the whole agenda is anti-left. He, The way he demonized the press, as much as I hate leftist media, the way he did it, I think, uh, I think put down the First Amendment. And I think now you're seeing a lot more of this uh, anti-free speech is going to come from both left and right. And I think we're in for, I think, and I think at the end, he split and destroyed the Republican Party. So I think today, there's basically no opposition to the agenda of the Democrats. There's nobody in opposition. We've got Josh Hawley, who basically on economics agrees with the Democrats. And we, and we, and then we've got, we've got Republicans who are just too cowardly to say anything. We, we've turned the Republican Party in a populist party in economics there's no pro, even semblance of pro, pro freedom or capitalism anymore. Well, that didn't cheer me up. <laughs> I, you're not here to cheer, to cheer me up, though. I'm in a cheery mood. No, I, you're not know. in a cheery mood, neither am I, particularly. I, I, you know, and I look at what's going on now with this HR one and federalizing our national elections and okay. the Equity Act and what's happening in culture. I mean, uh, you're on, I've, uh, you know, I, and, and look, I, we, we, our ideas, our ideas need to prevail. And I don't think I'm not giving us high marks and getting our word out. Uh, no, we're not. And, and it's, it's very frustrating. And I think part of it is, I mean, part of it, I do blame Trump for because I think a lot of people who should have been advocates for capitalism, got on the got on the bandwagon and got diverted away from from true the true free market message. And look, people have to evaluate Trump based on the fact that under his administration, Republicans lost the House, the Senate, and the presidency. I mean, a more you know, whatever it was, it was a losing strategy. And uh, the Republicans need to do real soul searching, and I'm afraid they're not doing it. And somebody needs to resurrect, whether it's a Republican Party or another party, an actual American free market political party. And maybe we need a third party. Maybe we need a new party. I don't know. But the Democrats and Republicans are so corrupt today, are so heading in the wrong direction today, that I really do fear for this country. Uh, we, need, we need somebody who has a, just a little respect for the founding fathers and the founding principles of this country. So, so we're, about, we're out of time. But... <laughs> Always happens to me. Oh, well, it always happens. We've got it. I, I do, we're just getting started. I know. I got to. I got to get a Joe Rogan slot. I need three hours uh, because what I'd like to do is like at some point I'd like to get you back, maybe on with John Allison or somebody like that to talk okay. about. All right, what should we be doing? I mean, what is what's the vision that we can paint for people? I mean, we know what's broken. Uh, and we know Trump's failings, and I, I, I'm not as tough on him as you are. But I, I, my biggest beef with him is he failed to build out anything bigger than himself, and yep. that we know doesn't last, and it didn't last. So I mean, I think I actually think we could learn a lot, and and I know it's not popular in the Republican Party to these days. We can learn a lot from Reagan. 
We can learn from his optimism and positivism yeah. verbally. Now, he didn't do as much as he spoke. I think he was a better speaker than a doer in terms of, in terms of what he, if you actually look at the bills past and so on. But I think we need to start by speaking that language. We need to be optimistic, positive, strong, and we need to embrace this country and not this country as, as just the geography. I mean, uh, it, but this country is a set of ideas that were laid out by the founders and we need to, we need to take head on this nonsense of the left, the 1619 project and the cancel culture and all that and embrace the greatness of this country and what this country really represents, but in not in, in vulgar terms, but in terms of hope and in terms of optimism and in terms of greatness, this country is the is I'm the so, great so with of, of humanity. Yeah, of I'm humanity. so I'm so with you on that. So now we've got the spine of our next conversation because we we started out talking about wanting to get together to talk about all the great things that are happening and can happen. I think we need to, we'll circle back to that uh, next time. So, Yaron, thank you. It was great to see you again and uh, and talk oh, after all these years and. Uh, Yaron Brook, chairman, and uh, I think mostly founder of the Ayn Rand. I wasn't the founder. I wasn't the founder. You didn't found it, but you. The CEO for a long you, time. You put it into stronger hands, using my term. You were, you were definitely strong hands there. Uh, so anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll be talking soon. Thanks.